is round four of Norway chess and we have an incredible pairing today it is world's number two versus world's number three and they are both having a great tournament so far as Alireza Firusha with the white pieces won two games lost one is number two in the tournament at uh, this point and he's playing against Fabiano Caruana who is having just an amazing tournament so far with two wins and one draw and in the first round he had a very impressive victory with the white pieces against world's number one Magnus Carlsen but let's see what happens in today's matchup between Alireza Firusha and Fabiano Caruana because we do get to see a very interesting uh, game Firusha opens with 1e4 and now this time interesting uh, moment Caruana goes for the French defense himself and he is basically going for a line which uh, Magnus Carlsen played against him in the first round after d4 d5 knight c3 knight f6 once again is the classical variation and also Firusha goes for the move e5 knight fd7 f4 white is grabbing a lot of space in the center and now the move c5 all very standard type of uh, play in this uh, french opening white's having a space advantage but black will try to counter putting pressure against that pawn on uh, d4 the move bishop e3 was played and here caruana goes for a different setup than uh, carlson uh, played against him in that game there followed the move a6 i covered that game uh, extensively earlier this uh, this week and then uh, caruana played here very interesting uh, modern uh, move knight e2 look up all the details if you're interested in uh, in that line for today caruana goes for an even sharper continuation of um, taking on d4 c takes d4 knight takes d4 and here the move queen b6 is played as you see the queen is attacking the pawn on b2 and at the same time hitting the knight on d4 but white is not afraid of that pawn and instead will just play here the move queen d2 with the idea to castle a queen side next so that the king will protect the pawn but you don't get a chance to do it because black is going to take the pawn and you know this slogan that you should never take a pawn on b2 even if it's good here this is just modern chess we are just at the start of a very interesting theoretical battle some of these um, lines they are just uh, going into uh, move 40 or so it's really heavily analyzed nowadays and perfectly playable for black but of course by bringing out the queen early you are also violating the basic opening principles playing too many times with the same piece bringing the queen out early and at the same time neglecting your own development but let's see what happens rook b1 played attacking the queen the queen has only one square to go to goes to a3 and now the main option for white here is the move bishop b5 and that's exactly that line i was talking about which has been analyzed up to uh, move uh, 40 or so the main line continues here with knight takes d4 bishop takes d4 and now um, black would like to get rid of that uh, annoying uh, pin so plays a6 and after bishop takes d7 bishop takes d7 basically black is giving up the pawn on b7 doesn't care about it after rook b3 the queen will come back to uh, e7 but after rook takes b7 there is queen h4 and a lot of theory the queen can even come back to uh, d8 try to organize its own defense but i'm not going to bother you further with that probably this line will be discussed at some point on this uh, channel uh, anyway so let's go back to the uh, critical position the theoretical position as Firusha goes for an interesting uh, sideline and the question is whether he had prepared it or it was some sort of over the board improvisation instead of playing bishop b5 he decided to bring its knight from c3 to that square knight cb5 interesting idea attacking the queen and at the same time threatening a knight fork on c7 obviously the queen goes for the counter attack so in case you do give a knight fork there is king d8 hitting the knight while at the same time the rook on b1 is still hanging therefore the rook better moves first rook went to d1 and now the big question is of course how are you going to solve that threat of knight c7 because none of black's pieces are able now to cover that square and therefore you better make sure that when the knights come comes in to uh, to c7 there will no uh, there will not be any knight fork therefore 
interesting, bizarre looking move, rook b8. But makes a lot of sense because now, after Firusia's uh, move, knight c7, of course, black will have to give up the uh, right to castle. It's a check. The king goes to, uh, to d8. And now the king is in the center, is no longer able to, uh, to castle. And the question is, is that king safe there? Apparently, uh, for the moment, yes, because white will have to find new ways of opening up the, um, the center. And that's not going to be easy because don't forget that at this point already, black is two pawns up. So that is uh, very interesting. On the other hand, black also has some uh, serious coordination problems with that king. I already talked about it, but look at the other pieces. Bishop on c8 also requires a bit of time to get back into, uh, into play. First things first, black is threatening to take the knight on c7. The knight will come back to, uh, to b5. And now, rather than playing for, uh, for tricks, for instance, if you uh, would play bishop b4, pinning the bishop and the, um, and the king, there's knight takes c6, removing the defender of the bishop with check. After b takes c6, it's queen takes b4. The queen comes into the game. And even though from a material point of view, things are still looking quite nice for black, things are everything but simple because white's queen is active, you're about to castle next. So this is definitely not recommended for black to play. And instead, I really like Fabi's uh, move here as he decided to, uh, to continue developing, getting his knight from d7 to c5 with the idea to come in to e4 to attack the queen. And after the move bishop to d3, white continues with normal developing moves. Black takes the bishop with check. Queen takes d3. And now various interesting uh, possibilities. In an earlier game of um, Abergel against uh, Friedman, there followed the game, uh, there followed the move queen uh, a5 check is an interesting move. Try to get the queen back into defense. Even a move like a6 questioning the knight also does make a lot of sense. But here, Caruana goes for the move bishop d7. Also very logical. It was part of its own strategy of moving that knight away from d7, trading it off so that the bishop could join play. And already at this point, we do reach a very important uh, juncture. Because how should white proceed? You feel the tension. You feel the urge of proving your compensation. You're two pawns down. So you, on one hand, you need to act very uh, very fast here. On the other hand, it does make sense to make sure that all your pieces are going to join play and particularly your own king also needs to be brought into a safety. So by far the most logical move here would be just to castle kingside. And then your king is absolutely safe. There are no any annoying checks. The rooks are connected. So their idea is also to go after the queen on a2, but with a rook on f1, who knows, maybe at the right moment you're able to uh, to play f4, f5, trying to open these files. So what Firusha saw here, I'm not sure. I, I don't understand the reason he refrained from playing this move. Instead, he played knight d6, which is on one hand very understandable, but I believe that the other pieces were not ready for it yet. And um, now after bishop takes d6, of course, you want to get rid of that knight because it's actually quite funny. For the second time this game, it is a knight which is uh, threatening a knight fork. This time on f7. You better get rid of that as, um, as black. Therefore, bishop takes d6, e takes d6. Still, the, the black king is potentially vulnerable. Imagine a queen could come in with the support of that pawn on d6. That could be uh, very annoying. But... On the other hand, a lot of pieces are just getting traded uh, already at uh, this point, and uh, I fail to see the exact compensation, and particularly the next move, queen c4, superb move by, uh, by Fabi. He's offering the exchange of queens, and obviously if you do take on c4, d takes c4, the more pieces are coming off the board, the more valuable these two extra pawns will, uh, will become. Therefore, queen d2 played. Firusha tries to keep queens on the board. And the big question is, how is black going to untangle? Because there are still a few more decisions to be uh, to be made, how to get rid of the pawn on d6. But that's not the most relevant question for black. Black really wants to ensure that its king will be safe out of any danger and that the remaining pieces, these two rooks, they will be participating very soon as well. And therefore, the next move 
could have been just overlooked, underestimated by uh, by Fiusha. As Fabi played here to move f6. Now you may think, what is this? Is Black really intending to open up the, the center? That could be an idea at some point, but after the moves um, knight takes c6, b takes c6, the idea becomes uh, clear very, very soon. First of all, if you do take the pawn on a7, Black is going to ignore it, play rook b2 and launch a counter-offensive against um, White's uh, pawn on c2. But instead, the main point of Black's uh, previous moves is uh, going to be revealed now. As Firusha played instead of taking the pawn, queen a5, check. And now you understand, if king c8, there is queen c7 with checkmate. So that would be absolutely stupid. Don't do that. Instead, the king got to go to e8. But this was exactly the plan of Black. So that the king runs away to the king side and can always hide on f7 when given the chance. So in that case, the king is kind of safe and the rooks will be connected. But things are still not that simple. Queen takes a7 was played and obviously the rook is under threat. And if you play here the move king f7 to connect the rooks, then your bishop on d7 is hanging. So that cannot be played. And what are you going to do with that rook on b8? That is the main question. If you stay passive with the rook to guard your back rank, then probably white's rook will come in via the b-file, probably to b7. And it is white who is still having quite a nice initiative with the queen and rook together on the seventh rank. A lot of potential problems can uh, can appear very soon so therefore the next move is another very important resource as kawana played here the move rook to b2 and this is very very important because you're just trying to win that pawn on um, on c2 and now well there are kind of uh, some kind of uh, ideas here like you could uh, could play a move like uh, like rook c1 which is still very very tricky but uh, obviously black still has ways trying to consolidate. Just make sure that you don't take the pawn on c2 right away, because if the rook takes, queen takes, rather than giving a check on the back rank, look what happens here. You can pick up the rook on h8, but then it, it would just be a perpetual check at least with uh, king f2, queen c2, and if you try to run away, it's even queen g6. That could be a funny repetition of moves. On the other hand, rather than giving the check already, you can just castle, and uh, still, black has this problem of, uh, of its king. Uh, the, the rook on the b-file is uh, seriously missed. Therefore, after something like rook c1, it's better just to keep that rook on, uh, on b2 for the, for the moment and uh, try to neutralize the, the pressure on the, uh, against your, uh, your king. So, for instance, um, yeah, a move like, uh, like c5 could be considered with ideas to go bishop uh, b5 next. But let's see what, what happened in the game as um, Firusha got very tempted here with the move queen a8. Of course, it is a check and the king got to go to f7, but then there is queen takes h8. And did Firusha did not calculate, he, he didn't calculate properly or what, did he miss something? That's still the, the big question as here black launches a very strong attack against the white king, which thanks to that earlier move, queen c4, is not able to castle any uh, any time soon. And here, the key move is queen takes c2 with a huge threat of checkmate on e2. If you block with the rook, it's gonna be queen c1, king e2, and then it's rook takes d2, bishop takes d2, queen takes h1, and look at the overwhelming amount of pawns, while at the same time, you're still having the initiative with the queen threatening to take the pawn on g2 with check. So therefore, bishop d2 was played, blocking the mating threat, but queen e4, check, is played. The king got a move. If you go to f2, you can even take with the queen on f4, another pawn, as the bishop is not allowed to take because of that pin along the second rank. So therefore, king f1 played, but now queen d3 back, king e1, and uh, now the absolute key move, Rather than going for a repetition of moves with the move queen e4, we are playing for the initiative because this rook on h1 is still out of play and therefore the move c5 is really, really strong. It's not that we are going to run with the pawns, but if here you're going to play the move queen uh, d8 with the idea of capturing the bishop, threatening um, 
something on e7, for instance. You just got to be very precise. If you do play bishop b5 right away, it seems like it's game over. The mating threat on e2 can not really be stopped. But there's queen e7 check. And after king to g6, it is queen takes e6 and the queen covers the e2 square. Therefore, after queen d8, it's very important to start with a check on e4. The king got to move. If the king goes to f1, the bishop joins the attack from b5 with tempo. So that would not be a great idea. King f2 could be a nice uh, move, but there is queen takes f4. Check, the queen cannot be taken, as I already pointed out. And after king e1, the killer move here is queen to h4 with check. The king can only move to a light square, but if you go king f1, it will be once again bishop f5 with tempo. And after king g1, it's going to be queen d4 with a beautiful checkmating pattern of queen and bishop. Instead, if you go g3, then it's queen e4 and you do attack the rook in the corner. After king f2, the rooks are protecting each other. Now the bishop has got to move to b5. And still, you just have a huge initiative despite the minus rook. King, queen e7 is not dangerous. There is the move king to g6 and there are no checks any longer because the e8 square is covered by the bishop. If you do play rook h to e1 to cover the e2 square, it's queen d4 check, attacking the rook, uh, sorry, the bishop on d2, and you're going to regain the material. Rook e3, rook takes d2, rook takes d2, queen takes. Now you're even threatening to capture just the rook. King f3, keeping the rook protected. Queen d1, what a beautiful move. If king f2, it is the move queen f1 with checkmate. Of course, the same happens if you go to g2, it's mate on, um, on f1. While in case of king f4, there is the move g5 with checkmate. Beautiful mating pattern. This all didn't happen in the game, but it's a very relevant line. Now you understand that Firusha instead, his queen is out of play. He decided to play here the move h4. So that if he doesn't get time, he would play here the move rook h3, kick the queen out. It's Black's turn first. Bishop b5, renewing the mating threat. Rook h3 runs into queen e2. King f2. Only move, rook takes d2, rook takes, queen takes. Now black is only an exchange down. But still, he does have a lot of pawns for the exchange and an ongoing attack against the white king. King g3, queen e3, check. King h2, the white king tries to hide. Queen takes f4. If you go king h3, looks as if there's no good check, but bishop e2 with the idea of giving a check with a bishop on g4 leads to uh, to mate very soon. While in case of g3, we do have queen f2, king h3, and also now the bishop comes in to e2. This is a beautiful resource. It's a quiet move. And if uh, white plays here to move d7, there were no good checks. But now queen e8 would be a huge mating threat. But the killer idea is to play bishop g4, sacrificing the bishop. If you do take with the king, it's checkmate on f5. Beautiful display. By, uh, by black. But therefore, g3 and king h3 are not possible. The king went to g1. Now, very simple. We do play a number of checks. Queen d4, king cannot go to f1, should come back to h2. So therefore, we pick up the pawn on h4 just for free. Queen comes back to d4, king h2. Now a check on e5. That's also fine. The king goes back to uh, g1 and then collects another pawn. So at this point, you do have a bishop and not less than just five pawns for the rook. This is something you rarely see at the, at the highest level. And well, this is just uh, completely game over. Now, what white should do is probably queen takes h7. And you can still try to keep on uh, playing, but it's just a matter of time. The best move here for black would be to play queen e5. You would definitely not mind the exchange of uh, queens on h5. That's the only available check. Eventually, these pawns, they should decide the game. However, Firusha played here the move. Rook takes h7. He got ambitious. He does have a mate in one threat. Rook takes g7 or even queen takes g7 should also lead to mate very soon. But he missed the last move of the game as Fabi played here the move. Queen f8, offering the exchange of queens. And white has no longer time to take on g7 as the queen covers the pawn. Therefore, the exchange of queens is forced. 
But this endgame with four pawns and a bishop against the rook is just absolutely hopeless. And therefore, Fabiano Caruano won this game and extends the lead in the tournament. Now, he has an amazing tournament so far with three and a half points out of four games against such very strong players. That's something we have almost never seen before. Of course, we do remember doing a Caruana with seven out of seven uh, games winning in a row. That's something um, which has never been repeated ever since Fabi did that in the Sinkfield Cup a few years ago. Who knows? He's capable of winning a lot of more games. He will not do a Caruana, but he definitely can go for tournament victory. He has a fantastic position right now. He is even leapfrogging Alireza Firusha in the World Life Rankings with rating. He's now in second place behind Magnus Carlsen. This is just an absolute great tournament for Fabi so far. And I'm looking forward to see more exciting games played by him. And also, of course, also by all the others. I hope you enjoyed watching these analysis. If you're looking forward to more analysis, make sure to subscribe to the channel. And I'm looking forward to discuss it all with you. Thanks for watching. Give it a like. And I see you soon again. Bye-bye.